Okay. Very special this is, the Lord's Supper. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We don't do it near enough, for sure. But uh, definitely don't want to do it too much. The things we do too much seem to lose their meaning. So we want, want it to be very special. And in essence, we do it every Sunday by showing up and being here for one another. But we, uh, we can kind of forget about the Lord's death and what is involved in it. What He uh, suffered. And two different elements to the Lord's Supper because it's separate. It has to do with His suffering that He went through leading up to the cross and then His death. And those, both of those things, we are entering into a covenant with Him to be good sufferers and to give our life for Him. And I know there's a lot more to it than that, and, but uh, in essence, that's what we're doing when we get baptized. We're entering into His death and coming forth as a new person. And we're going to endeavor to... Live differently from then on. We 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 miss and we go zig and zag, and but uh, if we truly meant it when we did it, then it's going to stick. We're going to keep coming back to it. I'm going to turn this microphone on so that doesn't keep happening. I'll push this one out of the way. Hopefully that doesn't cause a problem. Brandon, you might go in there and shut this one off for me real quick. That's all the way to the left. The main one. <clears throat> that part's just like it was before. Since I got all the sound working better, so all these speakers have enough power to boost them, well, that's boosted all the mics, and we I've still got to figure out the adjustment on them. They just need to be adjusted down a little bit. Um, the Lord's Supper was given to us so we would not forget the price that was paid for our redemption. To remind us how ugly sin is. And so we never make light of it in our own lives. But we can get that way where things don't seem as bad as they once did. And uh, Jesus' death had a purpose it had a purpose of bringing together a community of sinners to come and recognize they are sinners, that they're all fallible, and that they're, they're, they're all in the, the same playing field. And we, not one is better than the other. We, we all have gifts, and we all have shortcomings, and we come together as one and show the forgiveness and the love for one another that Christ showed us, then something happens in that community. That community becomes something different than what's going on in the rest of the world. And we can lose sight of that if it were not for the Lord's Supper. That's why we have holidays. That's why we have different... Uh, Traditions, it's so that we don't forget. And the Lord's Supper is to bring us back to that, that time frame when the cross had somebody on it and He suffered getting there and then He, he bled and died on that cross because of our sin. And that's what it means when we go and we read uh, here in a little bit, we'll read where it talks about it is possible to partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily. That doesn't mean that there's some worthy and there's some not. Worthy has more than one meaning. We've lost that in time. Jesus, when He sent His disciples out two by two, He said, when you come into a city, you go to the houses of those that are worthy. Now, if you've got a big prideful heart, boy, you can really run with that, can't you? What he meant was, 
because the rest of his um, teachings with the brethren, with the disciples, was repentance. Come to a place of humility. And so then with that background, when he says, you go only enter into the houses that are worthy, he's saying only enter into the houses that have received this, that have come to repentance. They're not high and lofty anymore. They've come down to this level. They know that uh, they're, they're not worthy. So that's what makes us worthy. Coming to the realization that you know you're not worthy. If that's a problem for you, if you can't quite grasp that, you're missing the main element. To be known as worthy of the kingdom, to be known as worthy of salvation, you have to come to the place where you know you're not worthy of it. You don't deserve it. We don't deserve anything good. Listen, we walked away from a holy God. He had to do this to bring us back to Him. Every one of us that has ever, um, we come out of our mother, we enter into sin. As soon as we get of the age that we understand right and wrong, we take the wrong, don't we? We take the wrong. Then after we learn, when we're born again and we learn the, the awfulness of sin and what it did to Christ and what He had to do, then we can start working on that stuff. In this life, we'll never be perfect, but we will get better as we go along. If that's our goal, to please God. We get victory over things while still having problems with others. But little by little, as we learn, we grow, we can work on those things. But always you have to have the, the attitude of, my problem is this, but their problem is so much worse. If you got that attitude, this you're not worthy. The attitude is, we all have problems. We all have issues, and our job to come to church is not... For ourselves, we don't come here just for ourselves so that we'll be better, but we come here to serve. Because what God did for us, He served us. He gave His life. The one life that He had, He only became man one time. He's not going to do it again. He got to experience, you know, the angels desire to be like us and have actual knowledge like we have to be able to have children and love and, and all the things that go with it. The angels would love to have that. That's why they fell. They tried to take that. They wanted that for themselves. That wasn't their position. They fell and took that position and you see what happened there all the giants and everything that took place it was just horrible same thing happens when women try to take the position of a man horrible things come out of it just bad stuff come out of it <clears throat> but this is what it means to partake unworthily to partake of this ceremony when you have an inward Broken fellowship. Because Jesus' idea with dying on the cross, the purpose of bringing about, this was a purpose of bringing about a communion, a fellowship that cannot be broken. You see, His body was broken for you so that our fellowship cannot be broken. If you break fellowship, it's not God's fault. He made it to where you could be a part of an unbroken fellowship. But it can't be about you. It can't be about you and what you're not getting and what you think you deserve. It has to be about you getting along no matter what they do. That's unity. I'm going to get along with you whether you like it or not. And I know there's things that has to be dealt with along the way. And if it's done right, then it's good. Look, if you, if you come to me with a mad face and you're just angry with somebody, I'm going to say, I, I don't want to even listen to it. 
If you've got a legitimate problem, you come to me with a legitimate, loving, caring desire to want to see the church flourish and there's this problem, man, let's talk. Let's talk and let's do something about it. If you've got this broken fellowship in you, if you don't realize what the church is and what partaking really means and you partake unworthily, We'll read that in a minute in the scripture. But it all goes back to being humble. If you think that you are worthy, then you would partake unworthily. But if you know you're not worthy, and just as unworthy as the rest of us, then you're accounted worthy to partake. That's all that means. But that's a lot. That really says a lot. But I've heard it preached different ways in my life and it's so freeing to know what it really means. All I have to do is just not judge people unrighteously. All I have to do is just know that I'm unworthy and I can partake because that's Jesus was the one that was worthy. He created you, created the world. He was the God of the universe and he humbled himself to the death of the cross. Surely we can humble ourselves for each other in the little things that goes on in our life. Surely we can overlook some things and forgive. Surely God overlooked a lot when he came down to earth and became a man. He did it out of love. Compassion for the lost. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's begin in verse 1. This is Paul setting up the Lord's Supper for the church at Corinth. This church at Corinth, they were just doing everything all out of whack. They, one person wanted preeminence over the other. They were competing for positions. And this is what he uses to show them to bring them back down to earth. In verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says to them, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He's going to liken everything that took place in the Old Testament as the same thing that took place with us when we are baptized into Christ. Look at verse 3. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. They're they're an example to us, you see. Verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them And that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. You mean after their baptism? After they went through all those miracles and God showed up and showed favor on their lives? That God can be unpleased with them? See, he's saying the same thing can happen to you. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. That word overthrown is very interesting because it only is mentioned in the scriptures with the wicked. Proverbs 12, 7 says, The wicked are overthrown and are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. They were overthrown in the wilderness. You mean after their baptism, after God showed them favor, when they turned away from God, they were overthrown in the wilderness. This is what Paul is trying to tell this church at Corinth. They're so haughty in their religion, you see. They're so haughty in their religion, he's trying to bring them back down to earth. He says in verse 6, Now these things were our examples 
to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. See, that's the part where if you have a problem with something, if you know something's going to damage the church or something's causing a problem, if you just murmur around, man, God says if you try to do that and cause division, that's when He gets against you. Not for sin in your life that you're dealing with, that you've said, I have this problem, God, and I want help with it. Help me. You're not condemned for that. He died for that. But this causing problems in the fellowship, that's what they did back there after they were baptized, after God had showed them favor. They drank of the same spiritual meat that we do. They went through all the motions. They agreed with God that they would keep that law and then didn't. Verse 11, it says, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. He says it twice. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We're not supposed to have this attitude of, you know, I, I did that back there and now I can go and live however I want to. I can act however I want to. I can be mean to people. It doesn't matter. I'm, it's all under the blood. Have you ever had that attitude? Do you know people that has had that attitude? I see it. I see it. It says they were overthrown in the wilderness. That means out in the world. Their true colors will come forth and they are going to leave. You won't see them anymore. Look at verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. In other words, there won't be an excuse. You can't say it was just too hard. Because it's not about the things that we struggle with. It's about how you deal with it after. Do you agree with God about it? Or, or if you, when you do cause problems, you make it right. You fix it. You apologize. Well, that's like a foreign word anymore. You apologize. I have to tell my guys every day, thanks for putting up with me. I, I just, I know that throughout the day, you, you say things, you do things in the midst of working. As long as everybody goes home, say at church too, as long as everybody goes home with the attitude of we're all the same. You're partaking worthily. You see that? You're worthy of that. So although they went through all the motions that we go through in our entrance into the kingdom. We get baptized. We, we proclaim Christ. They were, even, they were partakers of all those miracles. And, and just as soon as those miracles were gone, their spirituality was gone. They wanted more of that. They couldn't stand the thought of having to work for their food. God had been feeding them Manna from heaven, and now we got to get our own food. This stinks. That's, that's literally what took place, guys. 
you know, my, my kids, oh man, my kids, they make over me like you wouldn't believe. When I get home in the evenings, haven't seen me all day. They make over me. and Oh, I just love that. And it's because I do everything for them right now. There's coming a day when they won't need me to do everything for them. I'm going to miss those days when they <laughs> made over me, you know. But I'll be okay with it as long as they continue to honor me. Does that make sense? That's all God asked for. Just honor the things that I taught you. And all will be well. You don't have to be perfect. Just honor the things that I taught you, which was to love your neighbor as thyself. Just honor those things. And you can flub up, you can mess up, but if you love your neighbor as yourself, it's all washed away. It's covered. The Bible tells us that love covereth the multitude of sins. That's where it's at. That's what it means. You can partake of this and be as confident as ever that God will not be against you. As long as you're humble. That's it. That's all you got to be. Their offense wasn't the sin itself per se. It was the introduction of it into the body. Into the camp. At that time it would have been the camp. Now it's the body. We, if something takes place that we got to deal with, it's, it's not that we're mad at that person and they're so much different than all of us. They, it's because it can cause other problems in the body. It could teach our youth that that's okay. We're not dealing with people because we're better than them and they need to get straightened out. It's because we got to protect. If you're at home with your kids, you're going to do anything in your power to protect your kids. How many of you have guns? Yeah, it's a lot of hands. <laughs> it's not wrong to want to protect. It's not bad. Your attitude with it might be. <laughs> if your attitude is, I just can't wait till somebody breaks in <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can try, <laughs> try this thing out, it's not good. But if your attitude is, I hope I never, ever have to use this thing. <laughs> You're in the right place. And you're worthy to have it. You're worthy to have it. Paul tells him in verse 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. We look at that and we say, Boy, I don't have no trouble with that. I don't have any idols in my home. I'm good there. But he defines what idolatry is. And in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter you don't have to turn there if you don't want. I'll turn there and just show you. If you desire to, you can turn there to Colossians. It's right after Philippians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, it says... Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Members being what you do with your life. With all these members that you have. Your fingers, your eyes, your feet, where they go. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. Inordinate just means out of order. Could be an excessive affection you have for Bibles. Just kidding, Jennifer. Just kidding. 
Oh, I'm sorry. That in verse 5 in Colossians chapter 3. An excessive, an excessive affection for something that's not, that not, doesn't have to do with God. An inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is a lot the same thing. Concupiscence has that word uh, Cupid in it. You know what Cupid is, right? Little baby with the arrow. <laughs> Evil concupiscence would be a love that you desire that's out of order. That's not what it should be. Any kind of a relationship shouldn't be there. Or even for stuff. For worldly stuff. And then it, the last three words. Let's say this together. Which is... Idolatry. It's not having idols in your home. It used to be that because the idols would be set up there and you'd pray to this thing hoping it would bring you riches and all this stuff. And So now without the idols, we do it by what we go after, what we desire in our lives. So he says to the church at Corinth, flee idolatry. Flee these things that come before you in Christ. Whatever it is that's in your life that's coming between you and Him, get it out of there. A lot of us won't even know what that is till we learn for a while what may be an idol in our life. One day we'll come along and we'll say, oh boy, I'm going to have to give that up. That's keeping me from church on Wednesday night or keeping me from my head being screwed on right. Something like that. You learn as you go. But it's all about the attitude. But people that just get saved and they're dirt all over them, they're filthy from the world, can partake. Worthily. As long as they're not standing up there saying, I'm better than somebody else. You see that? If you get that, then you can partake and not have to worry. You can know that you're pleasing God in that. If someone asked you to be an usher or a, a teacher, teach a class or to clean the church or, or something, there was a need that needed to be filled and, and you said, I don't come here to do anything but listen to the message. There might be a problem there because we're supposed to come here to serve. To fill the voids. You don't have to do it all yourself. But you should be willing to help and partake of the duties. That's what it means by by uh, it, it's in your attitude. Am I here for myself? Is it all about me and what I can get out of it? I can tell you, you're not going to be very happy in any church if that's your reason for being there. But this is all these things is what it means to partake either worthily or unworthily. This attitude of, of humility is all it takes to be worthy. The answer should be, I come to serve. I come to see who I can help. I come to see who I can encourage. You know, a lot of us are just good encouragers. When we have handshaking time, people are hugging. and Man, I get encouragement from that. There's people that will follow me all around this thing. Say, I've been chasing you all the way from the other side. Just want to shake your hand. What encouragement. It's a commune. Not one of the weird ones like you hear about out there. <laughs> it's a real live community that's unbroken. It's a family. That's a good word for it. If there's anything, if you're harboring bitterness towards somebody else in the family, probably not a good idea to partake unless you're willing to get that right. 
Get it right. Even if they're not ready. If your heart is right and you say, I'm not holding any bitterness anymore. I know I'm, I could be just as guilty as them and in other ways. If that's your attitude, partake. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Next chapter over. We set the stage and why Paul said all that before he tells them how to do the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, and let's look at verse 26 to start, and then we'll back up when we actually do the supper. Verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Listen, do you know that's the exact opposite of being declared not guilty? When I got saved, I was declared not guilty. He's saying here, if I partake unworthily, I am guilty again. This is serious business. It's not to be messed with. If I'm harboring bitterness in me, it's serious that I get it right. I don't even have to wait till I have to go talk to them. If it's me right now, I'm getting ready to partake and I've got this bitterness within me, I can say, oh God, I just realized how silly I've been. I'm done with that bitterness. You can partake. And know that you're, you can be confident that God is pleased with you. Oh, it's so, it seems so easy, doesn't it? But the flesh, the pride that we hold inside, it is strong. But you have to overcome that pride. You have to. That's what repentance is. It's becoming down to a low estate after being your mind thinking this much of yourself and then being brought back to reality. That's repentance. Yeah, you'll still struggle with things, but the acknowledgement of that is where it's at. Verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But, this is the thing, I can't tell you whether you're worthy or not. This is between you and the Lord. It says, but let a man examine himself. Let a man examine himself. This is why we have an open Lord's Supper and not a closed one like so many have or another one's called a close one. As long as you're Baptist, you can partake. It's open because you're supposed to examine yourself. I'm not supposed to examine you and tell you whether you're worthy of this or not. You examine yourself. Then if you, if, after you've examined yourself, it says, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. There's nothing in you that's divisive, that wants to cause problems. You just want to be a part of God's community. You can be confident. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That means not putting the Lord's body where it belongs. At the forefront of your life. Not putting the Lord's body as something very important. What he, what he partook so that you wouldn't have to partake of. He partook of that to make us free. And he did that for this community. That would come together and love one another as he loved you. And gave himself for you. We're to give of ourselves to each other. 
If we know that, we're willing to enter into that, we're not guilty. Look at verse 30. It's when people don't discern the Lord's body and they partake of it just fluently and don't care about nobody, it's all about them. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Sleep mean, meaning dead. They're dead in the grave. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. If we judge ourselves... I'm about this tall. I don't, I, I don't deserve to be up here, guys. I don't. I promise you. But the fact that I know that makes me worthy. You understand? It's that simple. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. God loves you enough to judge you in that moment, whether it be in, through sickness in your life, calamity, whatever it is. It's not always what's taking place. You've got to get that. You would know. Somebody asked me, I don't know why this is all happening to me. I don't know what I've done. I said, it doesn't always mean you've done anything. This world's fallen. But I said, God is not going to spank you and you not know why. I would never dare spank my kids if they didn't know why I was spanking them. Would you? Do you go up to your kid and say, you're grounded? Well, yeah, of course you do when they do something. But without them knowing why? No. God's not going to do that either. If you've done something that brings something like this on, you're going to know it. You're going to know what you did. So if you have no idea, when things happen to you in life and you don't know what in the world you could have done wrong, you didn't do anything wrong. It's just the fallen nature of this world. Verse... Uh, Verse 30. Thank you. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. There's a reason He's chastening. When I chasten my kids, it's so they don't get run over by a car. I want them to listen to me. I want them to, if they're running out in front of running out the street, I want to be able to say, Eli, stop, and him stop. I want him to fear me enough to where when I speak, he stops dead. That's what, that's God. He chastens us and causes things in our life when we're going astray. If he doesn't and he just leaves us alone, the world will overthrow you. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. Wait on one another. That's what that means. Wait on one another. Let's go get the, somebody go get them for us. Matthew, would you go get everybody and tell them we're getting ready to start Lord's Supper? <clears throat> Judging ourselves unworthy is what makes us worthy. You judge yourself unworthy, God judges you worthy. It's that simple. Back up to verse 23. 
For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Just take a piece, hand it down, I'll be over there. If you can't reach. Hand it back to AJ. You're welcome. Notice the bread is the matzah bread. It's done this way on purpose. It has uh, scars on it to remind you of the Lord's body. Brandon, would you take that from her? Oh, Mom's going to pick it up. Okay. I didn't get one for myself. <sighs> Dave, would you mind blessing the bread? Heavenly Father, we come for you from protect our lives. So all that help provide for us. That we may humble ourselves to thee and be served to others. Yes. May the Holy Spirit guide us, protect us, and walk over us in our day life. I ask him and trust him on my son. He's right for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. had to do with Jesus' suffering that he took before he even got to the cross. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup. Start on this side this time. No, no, bud. No, no.
keep hold of it. After the same manner, also he took the cup, and uh, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Got a bite to it, don't it? That's to remind us of the the little the bitterness that he partook of for us. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. How does it show the Lord's death? It just reminds people. Reminds us of, of his death. What took place? how serious sin is so that we don't make light of it in our own lives. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank You for this ceremony that You've given us to remember, to never forget what took place on that day when You, you bought our redemption with Your own blood and leading up to that point, You suffered many things. And if we could this day, Lord, we'd ask you to help us to be good sufferers for one another and not to be thinking about our own selves and be thinking about the betterment, the goodwill of others, and then you'll take care of ours. If we have that attitude, we'll never fail you. And help us to learn that on a grander scale that would cause people to want more people to want to be a part of this communion. The communion of being able to be in fellowship with the Father through the Son. And with the communion of the people, Jesus said, if you have done it unto these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. This is how we serve God, by serving one another. Lord, let us keep that at the very bottom of our heart and know that we, we are pleasing You. No matter how many things we struggle with in our life, love covers a multitude of our problems. 
If we're loving people and recognizing they have problems too, we don't know what's going on in their life. Just stay humble. We can know that we're pleasing you and we can always partake and not be ashamed and not wonder whether you're pleased with us. Lord, some may be thinking, well, I really need to get some things right today. And they need some time to talk to you. Help them to know this auditorium is open as long as they need it and we'll be as quiet as we can possibly be as we're walking out of here to do other business. Let them know that their desire to stay in here and talk to you is a very big sign of repentance. And that's what makes us worthy. Lord, in Jesus' name I pray it. Amen.